Hey guys, my name is Annie and welcome to my channel, 10 to Life, where I am bringing you full true crime cases in under 10 minutes. Full cases, start to finish, but only what you wanna hear. None of the boring storylines or the empty plots, just the key facts, the most insane details, and all the unexpected stuff we know happens along the way. I'm coming to you directly from my apartment here in Brooklyn, New York, which if you're watching the video version of this on my YouTube channel, you can see beautiful New York behind me. And if you're listening to the podcast version of this, but you wanna check out the video version, feel free to head over to my YouTube channel. If you guys like what you hear, please like, comment, share, review, and don't forget to subscribe by clicking that subscribe button below. If you have any case recommendations, send them my way. I would love to hear them. And don't forget to follow me on social at underscore Annie Elise. So let's get into the case. Hey guys, welcome back. So before we jump into today's case, I just wanna give you guys a little bit of a warning. It's a pretty extensive case, so I'm gonna to try to fit it into the 10 minutes, but it might end up being more of like a 15 to life or maybe like a 20 to life and not necessarily a 10 to life. I'm gonna try my best though, but there's so much information and so many crazy details, I don't know that I'm gonna be able to fit it all in. So just a little bit of a warning. And the case that we're gonna be discussing today is one that I'm sure you've heard of. We've all heard about it in some sort of regard, and it is commonly referred to as the House of Horrors, otherwise known as the Turpin family. This horror case starts in January 2018 when a 911 call led police to a house about 70 miles outside of LA, California, and they made a gruesome discovery. When police arrived, they discovered that 13 children had suffered abuse and torture at the hands of their parents, Luis and David Turpin. Dating back to July 1988 all the way through March 2015, Luis and David had 13 children, 10 daughters and three sons. So before we get into the bombshell that happened after this 911 call and this discovery was made at this house, let's go back to some key events that really led up to this horrific discovery. In the late 1990s, Luis and David and the family moved to Fort Worth, Texas, and neighbors described them as not really interacting with other neighbors, they weren't very talkative, they rarely saw them outside, and they say that they never saw the children. During that time, one of the girls was bullied at school for wearing the same clothes every day and teased for smelling of body odor. Fast forward, and in June 2001, the very first police interaction with the Turpin family takes place. And the sheriff deputies go to the Turpin house because there were reports coming in that a four-year-old girl had been bitten by a border collie. Nothing sinister, nothing crazy, but still their first interaction with the police. Then fast forward a couple more years to February 2003 and they have their second encounter with the police. And this time the sheriffs go to the Turpin house because apparently their pigs got loose. Yes, they had pet pigs apparently. And they ate a 55 pound bag of dog food belonging to the neighbor, which that whole story is so bizarre. First of all, I guess people have many different pets, but I just haven't really ever heard of a lot of pet pigs. And then a neighbor calling the cops on their other neighbor because their pet pig ate their dog food. I mean, it's just so crazy and bizarre. But again, nothing sinister, nothing criminal, just another encounter with the police. And those were the only two times police ever interacted with the Turpin family until this 911 call. In June 2010, the entire family decides to move from Texas to California. So they move to a beautiful two-story home in Marietta, California, which is just outside of Riverside County. The reason for the relocation was due to David's job, but again, neighbors say they didn't interact with anyone, that they rarely saw the children, and that they were just very standoffish and kept to themselves. The oldest son was enrolled in classes at Mount Sac, a local community college. However, his mom, Louise, would always go to campus with him and wait for for him outside of the classroom to escort him home. She never let him go to campus alone and she would always sit there and wait outside. The following year in October 2011, Luis and David decide they want to renew their vows and head to Vegas with the entire clan of children. They go to Vegas, they renew their vows in a little wedding chapel and they have Elvis actually doing the ceremony. And they actually post photos online which is very interesting because they were so notorious for keeping to themselves. And in these photos you can see all of the children and they are completely dressed alike, similar haircuts, the exact same outfits, and it kind of looks like a little bit of a weird cult. Really quick before we move on, I'm just gonna throw up a side by side because literally when I saw his picture for the first time, this is the image that directly came to mind. Am I crazy or do you see it too? Anyways, okay, let's move on. The next year in 2012, the family goes on a big family outing to Disneyland. And again, they post photos online and these children are all dressed alike. They look like this little cult. It is just very, very bizarre. 
In 2014, the family moves from that home in Marietta to a home in Lake Paris, which is very close to Marietta, again in Riverside County. And shocking, again, neighbors say they never interacted with them and they never saw the children. In December 2016, the family participated in a community holiday decorating contest. They built a nativity scene in their front yard and five of the 13 children were present with Luis and David during this community outing. And now we get to that disturbing 911 call when this entire bombshell really hits and everything begins to unravel. At 6 a.m. on January 14th, 2018, 13-year-old Jolinda Turpin and 17-year-old Jordan Turpin left their home through a small window. 13-year-old Jolinda became frightened and nervous, so she went back in, but Jordan continued and stayed out. Jordan gets a little bit of distance, and she calls 911 using one of her mom's old deactivated phones. But helpful hint if you're ever in a situation like this or you're in a situation that you need to call 911 and don't have access to your phone, even if a cell phone is disabled and not activated, it still will dial 911. The 911 call lasts for 20 minutes where Jordan's on the phone with this 911 operator and she's explaining to her how she and 12 of her siblings have been abused by her parents. We live in a family of 15 people and my parents are abusing, they abuse us and my two little sisters right now are chained up. And how many of your siblings are tied up? Two of my sisters, one of my brothers. How are they tied up? With rope or with what? With chains. They're chained up to their bed. She also tells the operator that the home smells so badly she can barely breathe. When the operator asks Jordan, okay, well, where do you live? Where are you located? Jordan replies, I don't know. I don't know streets. I'm never allowed outside. She didn't even know her own address. They begin tracing her phone because that's really the only way that they're going to figure out where these kids are located. And the operator again asks Jordan, okay, are we close? Do you hear the sirens? We're coming for you. And she says, I don't know. I really couldn't tell you. I don't go out much. And finally, her phone is fully traced and the police arrive thanks to her courageous call. Inside this house in Paris, which sits on a very quiet suburban street, police discover her 12 brothers and sisters. And they discover them chained and shackled to beds in a room covered in urine. And police say they all look like children even though seven of them were over the age of 18. The six youngest children were transferred to Riverside Medical Center and the seven older children were transferred to Corona Medical Center. I'm not sure why they split the kids up. I imagine that there's gotta be something different going on at both hospitals, but still, when you come on the scene and you see that this group of siblings has gone through something so traumatic, I can't imagine that it's in the best interest to split them up. I would imagine that for support, they still need to stay intact and be together. But what do I know? That same evening, which is January 14th, 2018, at 9 p.m., David and Louise Turpin are arrested, and they're charged with suspicion of child abuse and torture. And what's crazy is that at the time of their arrest, when police asked them, why were your kids chained and shackled to these beds, they couldn't even give an answer to police. Obviously, that's because there is no logical reason. As the investigation begins, it takes a team of at least five sheriffs deputies to remove and empty out that putrid house. And they had to open every single door and every single window to air the house out because of how bad the stench was. Which, it's probably the first time that house has ever seen sunlight or fresh air in years. Now that the arrests have been made and there's clearly a search happening at the house, the community starts buzzing. And two days after the initial 911 call, the Riverside County Sheriff's Department holds a news conference. They can't release a lot of details, however, they do announce that 13 children had been removed from the house and that they were chained up and starved. Was tied up and hogtied. And then when that victim was able to escape the, the ropes, uh, these defendants eventually began using chains and padlocks. That was two days later on January 18th, David and Louise Turpin plead not guilty and they plead not guilty to numerous allegations. Their parents pleading not guilty to 50 charges of torture, false imprisonment, and child abuse. And the Riverside County District Attorney holds another news conference to explain what's going on. And he says that the children were taunted with food and starved to the point of stunting their growth. They were beaten, choked, and chained. I mean, this is nuts. This story is literally ripped out of the script of a horror movie. It is truly disgusting. David Turpin is also accused of sexual abuse at that time. Jordan, the 17-year-old daughter who escaped, told authorities that when she was 12 years old, her father David pulled her underwear down, sat her in his lap, and tried to kiss her on the lips. She told authorities that the encounter abruptly ended when David heard the mother, Louise, coming down the hall. And he told Jordan, don't talk about it, don't tell your mom. 
That was really the only allegation that ever surfaced about sexual abuse. However, it is pretty telling and who knows what else these people were capable of that it really wouldn't be surprising if there was more abuse going on behind closed doors. Louisa's sister Elizabeth spoke and did an interview shortly after the arrest and she says that she went to the jail to visit Louise and that Louise was so disconnected from reality and she legitimately thought that she was going to get out and that she and the children were gonna play board games. That is what she told her sister Elizabeth, which that is extremely bizarre and is either a testament to her mental health and there being an issue there, or she really is just that disconnected from reality that she doesn't see the severity of what was done and what these charges are that have been brought against her. Which then poses a completely different question of, was she brainwashed and is that why she was so disconnected? Because the couple did marry when she was 16 and David was 23. So over the course of all of these years and because she was so young and impressionable, did he groom her to his lifestyle? Is that why she doesn't understand why it's such a big deal and how severe this really is? Because she was so used to it at this point and brainwashed to think that it was okay? I don't know. The paternal grandparents of the Turpin children also soon speak out, and they say that they were completely surprised and shocked by these allegations that have surfaced. And they say that they had talked to David once or twice, but that they haven't visited in several years. And they say that when they did visit several years ago, all of the grandchildren looked healthy and seemed happy, so they didn't suspect anything was going on. So now we fast forward all the way to June 20th, 2018, and the Turpins have their first hearing. And the purpose of that preliminary hearing was to show the evidence and probable cause to the judge to get an indictment. So during that hearing, the 911 call is played. The prosecution also shows a photo of two of the children chained up. And the judge rules that of course there is enough evidence to go to trial. Now this is where all of the evidence and all of the history slowly begins to unfold. The children were permitted no other activities except writing in journals. So when police went to the scene and searched the house, they found hundreds of journals that these children wrote. And luckily for them, it outlined everything, all of the gruesome details, all the horrific moments, and basically everything that is going to get these two horrible human beings locked up. These journals supplied an incredible amount of evidence. And it begins by outlining how the parents beat, starved, choked, and chained all of the children ranging all the way from age 2 to 29. And it outlines how the reign of this terror really began 18 years ago when their old house was found with scratch marks on the walls and feces on the wall, which I don't even know how that gets there. And the closets were converted into cages. I mean, it is honestly a Stephen King movie. It is a Stephen King movie. And the abuse intensified over time. What started as child neglect became severe, pervasive, prolonged child abuse. The children were confined to their rooms for up to 20 hours a day. They were only allowed to shower once a year. They have never seen a dentist, and the last time they went to the doctor was four or five years ago. The children were also forbidden to socialize with each other. And whenever they were caught trying to take food because of course they were starving, the parents would chain them to their beds as punishment. The parents also banned the kids from exercising and the children were only allowed to sit down or lie down in their rooms. They weren't allowed to stand. Which makes me wonder, is that why this house was completely covered in filth and boxes and junk because it then made it physically impossible for anybody to stand because there was no standing room? Or were they just disgusting hoarders? Either way, the children were only allowed to sit down or lie down, which I'm sure also plays into why their growth was so stunted. It's so heartbreaking. The journals also outline how the parents would feed the children bologna and jalapeno sandwiches while indulging in these amazing great meals themselves right in front of them. And Luis and David would buy these great beautiful desserts and beautiful pies and leave them on the counter to taunt the kids and would leave them for so long that the food became moldy and infested. I mean, they were truly trying to do some psychological damage to these children. At one point, one of the daughters, who was nine years old at the time, was caught stealing food. And her mom, Louise, tells her, bring me your cat. Her mom put the cat outside and made this little nine-year-old girl watch as wild dogs tore this cat to shreds making her daughter literally watch as the dogs ate her pet cat in front of her. It is horrifying. They weren't allowed to play with any of the toys they had. When the parents would buy them toys, they would keep it in the packages and put them in the closet, but the children were not allowed to touch them or play with them. Again, abusing them mentally and maybe trying to even condition them. The children weren't allowed to ever go outside, so essentially they could never even have the option to escape. It was also written that the Turpin family, including the parents and the children, would sleep all day and then were awake all through the night until 5 a.m. When the children were evaluated at the hospitals, most of them had muscle wasting and some of them were underweight as much as 32 pounds. Two of the daughters will never be able to have children and suffer from psychosocial dwarfism, which is a growth disorder caused by severe stress. 
So now there is an overwhelming amount of evidence here. And finally, on February 22nd, 2019, Luis and David agree to a plea deal. And they plead guilty to one count of torture, four counts of false imprisonment, six counts of cruelty to a dependent adult, and three counts of willful child cruelty. And David and Luis Turpin are sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole in 25 years, which could put them out as early as 2044, which in my opinion, that sentence is very, very lax and it should have been much harsher. However, when handing down the sentence, this is what the judge says. The only reason that your sentence is less than the maximum time allowed is because you accepted responsibility in an early part of the proceeding. And with that, you spared your children having to relive that harm and humiliation by going through a trial. Being chained up. Sometimes I still have nightmares of things that had happened, such as my siblings being chained up. My parents took my whole life from me, but now I'm taking my life back. According to an attorney for Louise Turpin, 10 of the children have 10-year restraining orders against both parents, and two of the children have five-year restraining orders. And these restraining orders halt all communication. No phone calls, no letters, no visits, nothing. Several of the adult children are now living on their own with others being in group homes and the six youngest of the children being adopted by other families. It's reported that the siblings also have been taking great care of their mental health and regularly meet all 13 of them together. Some of the children have changed their name for privacy reasons, which I completely understand. And what's really fantastic is these children are not allowing this horrible situation that happened to them define them. And the children's attorney speaks out and says, some of them are pursuing education and getting their GED. One of the children is in college. They're all using public transportation and riding bicycles, showing that they're not scared to be out there and they really do want to interact with the community. One of the children actually graduated college and is pursuing a career as a medical field technician. And their attorney says they want people to know that they are survivors and that they are normal, young, happy, healthy adults doing what everybody else is doing out there. Which to me, that is so powerful and so amazing. And I mean, the resilience that these children have is truly unbelievable. Some of them have even stated publicly that they love their parents and have chosen to forgive them. I mean, the level of maturity that these kids have is truly unreal. And Luis and David should be thanking their lucky stars that not only did some of them choose to forgive them, but that their children still turned out as great as they did, despite the horror that they put them through for the majority of their lives. Thanks so much for listening to this case with me. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe to my channel. Please like, comment, review, and share. I would love to hear from you guys. And until next time, thanks guys.